Fantastisk. Nå tændt. Okay, welcome back. Now we have a, a company presentation by DHL, which is, is interesting because it ties into our, our discussion about culture. So I'd like to introduce Pia Scott Rødam. Thank you, welcome, and uh, again, ask questions, interact, have fun. Okay, well thank you very much, Kasper, um, and thank you for having me. I've been really looking forward to coming and telling you something about DHL Express. Um, as Kasper said, my name is Pia. I've been working with DHL Express for almost 14 years, uh, and my area is within um, HR and what we call first choice. So it's process optimization, communication strategy, and human resources. Um, and what I'm here to tell you a bit about is, of course, just an introduction to DHL Express to begin with, and then a bit about the key resources we have, the strategy we have, and how we tra try to make it live every day. Um, because whatever you've been told about processes and models, etc., it has to live. It has to be implemented. And I'm trying to give you uh, a few examples of how we make it work in DHI Express. So, we are the most fantastic international transport and logistics company in the world. Just if you were in any doubt about that. Um, we are truly international. We cover 220 countries and territories. Um, you can see the 13 dots are the ones that we don't cover. Um, it's a massive organization. DHL Express is one division um, of five within the Deutsche Post um, DHL group. And um, there's about 100,000 like me um, all around the world. So Express people, um, we have the biggest airline in the world. Uh, it may not be registered as such, but we actually fly in and out of loads and countries every day. We have three major hubs, and we have loads of sub-hubs, one of which is here in Copenhagen, flying into the Nordics, um, which was hub of the year, so we're quite proud of that. Um, we have 4,000 service centers around the world, and we service millions and millions of customers each and every day. Um, as you can see, 154 million shipments every year, because that's what we do. We transport things from A to B as fast as possible, or per customer requirements. And during the route, we scan so that we know where the parcel is, and so the customer has visibility of it, and that turns out to be more than 6 billion checkpoints a year. So that's pretty much DHL Express. So if we look at what we produce, we have a variety of products, um, and they're all defined by their time sensitivity. So if you are a company and you'd like to have something in Asia on the next possible business day, maybe even before 12 or before 9, you'll choose that time definite product. If you have a few more days on you and maybe would like things a bit cheaper, you can choose our day definites. And if you have a very urgent particular thing that you need to get as soon as possible to anywhere in the world, we can put it in the hands of an employee, put them on the next possible plane, and you will be buying a same-day service from us. It's pretty simple. Um, we've also now come into the e-commerce business. We were traditionally a uh, business-to-business business, which means that we picked up from companies and we delivered to companies. But as you all know, it's a changing world. And e-commerce, so where you buy something off the internet and you expect it to be delivered to your home address, that's growing, and we've had to be agile and adapt to that. So the e-commerce business uh, is an increasing part of what we do. And that has some implications for our network, our activities, our partners, which I'll come back to. Um, and of course, it also has an impact on the way we define the customer, um, because all of you are potential DHL customers because you receive parcels on your home address, or potentially receive parcels on your home address. And you've got some very different needs than when we talk to a procurement manager uh, in a multi-million global business. Good. Value proposition I'm not going to go through, but of course, whatever we produce is steered by the needs of the customers. And we... Um, claim to be an insanely customer-centric culture business. Um, the ones who've been with DHL for ages and ages were pioneers in the uh, 70s and 80s, 
And when a customer called, then they would fly out to that place with a suitcase of money, they would hire some people, and they would start having courier services in that area. And that culture sticks with us. So our value proposition is all about the urgent needs of the customer of having goods delivered or sent. Um, and of course, there were various um, characteristics of that need that we try to uh, live up to every day. So our customer promise is excellence simply delivered. And that may sound really simple, but the problem is, of course, do we actually deliver on that promise? So the moment of truth in any kind of service company, including DHL Express, are in the touch points where we meet the clients. And it's not only if they are rationally being given the service that we've actually promised, it's not rationally if their parcel has arrived um, at the receiver on the specific date and within the specific time set. It's also which kind of feeling we make with the customer. Because if we want to have emotionally engaged customers, they need to have a great feeling of being serviced by DHL Express. Now, um, have you heard about emotionally engaged customers? All engineers, no emotions, just solutions. <laughs> okay, emotionally engaged customers is the ultimate customer to have. And that's because they become loyal. Um, the ultimate sign of being a loyal customer is if the customer wants to recommend us to others. So we're in, we're in it not just for the um, service delivery, we're in it for the emotional engagement. And that's because loyal customers stay longer, they spend more, and they make referrals. So they recommend us to others so we get more clients. And in order to achieve that, then we have to be really, really sharp in that moment of truth, in that touch point. The customer will come with needs from the business, previous experiences with either us or other logistic providers, and expectations of what we're going to deliver. And in order for us to meet those needs and expectations and create profound, vicarious experiences with DHL Express, we need to have our ducks in a row. So throughout the process that you see up here, which you can't sit, well, which I can't point to because this is a laser pointer, but you can see the process that we have up here where we, we pick up, we process, we fly, we sort, we scan, and we deliver. We need to have the best possible processes, most efficient processes, but we also need the kind of behavior that when customers meet us, they will say, wow, I can't imagine sending with anyone else but DHL Express, because that interaction gave me something that I'm not getting anywhere else. And that, of course, is not only about a network or a hub or checkpoints or digital presence. It's a lot about the human interaction that we have with our customers. And that doesn't only go for DHL Express, it goes for any kind of business. The mindset, the culture, and how it comes out in real life. Good. So I'm going to tell you a, a very short story. Um, a proof of whether a, a business is successful or not is, of course, the share prices. Now, we don't have shares only for DHL Express. We're part of DPDHL. And um, this is the development in their share prices. And as you can see, there's been a few low points. The lowest point was in, uh, in 2008, where you could actually buy a share for 6.74 euros. Pretty low, pretty difficult to be an investment of choice, um, because investment of choice is, of course, then that you can also share, um, sell your shares more expensively, get more cash flow in, cash that you can reinvest in your business, in your people. Um, so at this point in time, something needed to be done. Um, DHL Express was not always part of the DHL group. Um, Deutsche Post acquired the majority in 2002, and DHL Express was one of the entities that was really struggling. At this point in time, we lost more than two billion a year, and that's a lot of money for a group to subsidize. So what happened? Um, 2008, this brilliant man came on board, 
His name is Frank Apple. He's um, heading DP um, DHL Group. He came in and was actually responsible for our first choice, our process improvement program. Um, and when he became the CEO, he had visions. One of the things that he did was to hire this man for DHL Express. His name is Ken Allen. He's been our global CEO since 2009. Um, and he had been with DHL since 1985. He really knew the business. And he'd been in one of the loss-making territories, namely the US. Um, and as you can imagine, that's FedEx land, UPS land, our main competitors, so a very difficult market to be in. Um, and now he came and joined us. And I think he joined DHL Express because Frank Apple is a literate man. He has a university degree within biology, actually. Um, loads of experience, uh, he reads books, and when you're at a down point in your business, you have to look outside of where you are to ensure that you get inspiration to move forward. And I'm pretty sure that one of the inspirations he had was from Jim Collins' Good to Great. How many of you read Good to Great? Show of hands in here. One? Excellent, good book, isn't it? Excellent book. Like, he's my friend now. I'm very happy about that. So this is a, a very short sort of sum up about what well, Good to Great is all about. So Jim Collins and his team of researchers went in um, and looked at a bunch of companies. He looked at um, companies that had been doing well and then had declined again. And he looked at companies who over a, a long period of time consistently performed above market. And from that research, he and his researchers um, tried to define the characteristics of a great company, a high-performing great company. And the very first thing that you need to have in a great high-performing company are the right leaders, the right leadership. It doesn't start with strategy. It doesn't start with buildings. It doesn't start with all of the basic stuff. It starts with right leadership. That's all about people. And that's all about mindset of the leaders. And once you have the right leaders, which is why he probably brought Ken Allen aboard, because he's an absolutely magnificent leader, then these right leaders can hire the right people. And when you have the right people, you can install them with the skill set and the mandate and the competencies to perform and do what you want them to do and what they want to do. Because the right people are what you would call intrinsically motivated. Their motivation comes from within. Uh, and of course, I'm HR and I talk about people and you may think fluffy, fluffy, but there is a very big difference in a high performing team of people who motivate themselves and people who are motivated by external factors. And that's why the right people are so important. And also, of course, why the right leadership is so important, because, you know, good leaders, they hire great people and then they leave them alone. So if you have leaders who want to be taskmasters and micromanagers, etc., you will not get high-performing people intrinsically motivated. So once that's in place, Jim Collins um, defined from his research that that's when you then do the right strategy. And when you have the right strategy, then you can start building oops, your organization. And the right organization will be able to deliver the right thing at the right time, in the right quantity, and the right quality. And you, you all are familiar with the lean, right? Lean principles? Some not, okay. So you can see that right thing, time, quantity, and quality is exactly what we're trying to achieve with the lean methodology. And that's basically, it sounds pretty simple. Um, so what Frank Apple did at a corporate level was to speak into this kind of model. So first of all, he launched a strategy in uh, 2010, which not only had our customer promise of connecting people, improving lives, sorry, that's the vision, uh, and the customer promise about being the logistics company of the world, but there were also quite detailed um, statements about which kind of leadership philosophy he wanted to have. Uh, and our leadership philosophy is called respect and results. And it's all about we want to deliver results without compromising on respect. And he felt so deeply about this that it was actually an addendum to the annual report in 2009. Um, and it's been, it is a fundamental characteristic of the DPDHL and also the DHL Express um, culture 
that as leaders, we're responsible for people, we're responsible for the results, and we do not deliver results without compromising on respect. I'm just going to let that sit for a moment, because when you go out, if you haven't been all right, out already in companies, you will find loads of companies where it's all about results. It may also for you be all about your own ambition. And in those companies, you will have high people turnover, which is massively costly. You will have teams that are not able to work together. And that's one of the qualities that we have in characteristics. We work as one, and we talk a lot, a lot about how we work as one, because we win together and we lose together. So one high performer is only a high performer if that person can work within the team and ensure success for everyone else as well. Um, good. So, of course, then the strategy came, which was pretty clear what we wanted to do from both from 2010 to, to 2015 and recently, 2015 to 2020. Um, that's the focus, um, the strategy there is called Focus, Connect, Grow, which is about focusing on the right things, connecting through all of the divisions and having organic growth. And it's being communicated to all of the 400,000 employees in DPDHL and of course also into DHL Express, but we've also translated into our own focus strategy, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And then the final thing, the lean part, we have a massive program called First Choice. We want to be the customer's first choice, which is why it's called that. Um, and it's both Six Sigma, so we use the DMAIC model to run improvement projects, and it's also lean principles that we, to an increasing extent, work into everyday life. So, Gemba walks, um, board talks, or what we call performance dialogues, which is massively implemented, 5S exercises, um, and of course, that also supports the leadership philosophy. Um, because in lean, also the leadership is turned around, so it's removing hindrances for people to perform, it's not that people perform to make you successful as a leader. So it all hangs together, um, fundamentally. Um, in any, whenever you want to do a change, and this was a change um, at this point in time in, in, uh, uh, in DHL Express. Um, yeah, sorry, you have a question? Oh, we, I, I've been told that you have to have this, if you can hear. There you go. Thank you. Um, if you just go back, may, maybe it's okay to be on this slide, um, but I have a more general question. Now that uh, you talk about respect and results, mm -hmm. and that this is something that's um, significant for your company, I guess it's also for many others, but, but that there is a tendency that it's uh, more common, that it's just results that's uh, in focus in many companies. Um, why do you think it is so? Why don't all companies adapt to uh, respects and results uh, compared to just results? I think it's a cultural change. Um, and I think it's also, it has to do with, with what we've been taught about how um, businesses create results. Now, I was young in the 80s, you weren't. And I remember the culture that was, um, that w was in the 80s about um, how you were a good employee. You worked long hours, you were ruthless, you know, you had sores on your elbows, and that was a kind of role model back then. Um, previously with industrialization, etc., cetera, um, it was all about performance and high performance and KPIs, and we haven't had a tradition of thinking a lot about not only a good work life, but a good life and a good work life balance. And even now, when I go around in the world and talk to my international colleagues, there are loads of, loads of countries who are still not adapting that kind of way of thinking. And they look towards the Nordics as one of the places where that's actually very integrated in our national cultures, to have that kind of care around each other. That has been traditionally seen as weaknesses, and it's not something that we've been training a lot uh, as, as managers as well. And I think if you... If you were to go into some of the traditional leadership programs now, it's about Galbraith and Porter and models, etc. But the people part is, to some extent, still very small uh, in how you create results. So even though we say that leadership is about creating results through others, the motivational factors, the engagement factors, change management, is still sort of sub-modules that you can choose to take or not take. That's my, that's my personal view on it. Does that help? It does, okay. 
Good. Any other questions? No, the question's good. I mean, HR is still considered the fluffy stuff, right? The expendable stuff. There are loads of companies where human resource is not part of management boards. Um, and if I have to take a dip at human resources because I have a different background myself, it's also because it's sometimes it's just the fluffy stuff. But human resources needs to be business oriented. It's a mix. It's an enabler for business results. So that's still a a cultural thing that needs to grow in loads of organizations. And we talk about, when you talk about organization and structure and power, whether you have people business in the management boards is a very clear indicator of whether that business is actually taking their people as a key enabler seriously. Come back to it. Okay, good. So back to this influencer. Um, I think it's a, there's a, a source here, I think it's a very good book. Again, researchers went out, looked at loads of change projects, and saw which kind of characteristics have, do, do, do successful change projects have. Um, and it works at three levels, as you can see. It works with motivation. Do I, as an individual, want to change my behavior? It's a big ask, actually. Whenever, are you, are you, sometimes I have the example of the toilet roll whether you turn it with the paper outwards or inwards, which seems as a very small thing, but it, it can make really heated discussions in households around the world um, because it's a behavioral change. And whenever we ask somebody to change their behaviors, it's a very big ask. So motivation is a key factor in that. The other thing, of course, is am I able to? My ability to actually do what the expectations are. And I'm showing you this model because I'd like to just talk into it later on um, about some of the things that, we've, that we are doing and setting um, into our structure. So on an individual level, uh, in motivation, it's all about creating profound, vicarious experiences, as these researchers call it. So experiences where you actually um, get the motivation because you feel part of something or you feel a purpose. And we talk a lot about purpose. Frank Apple talked loads about purpose. Um, the DP DHL group and DHL Express is not only about efficiently transporting a parcel from A to B. It's about delivering joy. It's about delivering prosperity. It's about giving back to the world. We have environmental programs um, in place. We have help programs in place. We have disaster teams that go out and help with logistics. Um, when natural catastrophes occur. So, of course, we talk a lot about having a successful business. How does that impact the world? Both in the big picture, and Frank Apple goes to Davos every year, um, but also on an individual level. So how do we create the good lives for our employees? How do we ensure work-life balance? How do we ensure that they're fit to work and fit to live? And if an employee has those kind of exp experiences, this, Going to events, getting recognition, um, or feeling the power of delivering to a customer who needs the wedding dress, and it was late, but I drove out there, and I can see the joy on that person's face. That's an experience that sticks with you and motivates you on an individual level. Um, on a social level, of course, there has to be, a, this is, I call it team norming, but you might as well just call it peer pressure. You need to have norms in the group that enforces the kind of change or behavior that you would like. So, for instance, in high-performing teams, um, low performers are ill-regarded. Nobody, if you're a high performer, you want to work with other high performers. You don't want to work with the laggard in the corner who's not getting his things done, or who's late, or who's not delivering on promises. You want to work with other high performers. And that's a part of peer pressure having the norms in place, how do we behave here? What is the DHL way? Um, and it's something we talk about. I can tell you we have a, a massive European football tournament every year. Uh, and one year, um, one DHL employee hit another DHL employee. He was drunk. And everybody, that, everybody was appalled by it. And what we went around and said to each other was, that's not what we do in DHL. That's not the DHL way. It was not, it's not okay to hit anyone. It's, it's not what we do in this community across countries. Um, and this, of course, also goes for performance. And it also goes for belonging. So having, feeling that you're part of a family, 
not just a workplace, but you actually have a best friend at work, which is also part of the Gallup 10 motivational factors, which is below loads of, of different kind of, of theories and surveys around the world. Um, and feeling that when you come in, you're welcomed. And the final part is then the structural part. Um, because that's, of course, that you're motivated by being recognized for what you do well. So um, in any performance management, um, you will want to strive to what gives you a benefit, whether it's a clap on the shoulder, whether it's public recognition, or whether it's incentives, so money in the bank um, every year because you've reached your KPIs. Um, and actually, in our performance uh, programs, the bonus incentive schemes for leaders have respect and results in there. So we are rewarded on how our employees are rating active leadership um, across the divisions. And that's, that's a factor of, of how, how much we actually feel about this, how much we actually think it's important. So if you can get it into an incentive scheme, it's because it's important for a company. That's motivational parts. If we look at the ability part, then of course, we can ask people to do loads of stuff, but if we don't train them, we can't expect them to do it, and we can't expect people to want to do something that they're not really able to. You probably know that from yourselves. So if you're being asked to do something and you know I can't do it, and nobody's telling me how, and I can't get any, any um, classroom training on it, and nobody's going to show me, then I'm not really inclined to do it because I don't want to look stupid. Pretty basic. So skills, development, and training um, is part of the individual uh, motivational um, influencer in ability. Um, and then comes, when we have peer pressure, of course you want to have people who can do the same thing, cooperate about the same thing, because they have the same skill set. So that's pretty obvious that, that we need to not only have individuals who are experts, but we need to have skill sets which are across teams so that they can actually work together. Um, and in the structure, it's, it, this is a lot to do with lean. It's making sure that you have an organization where KPIs in one team and skill set in one team is not something different than what's being told in another team, so it clashes. Um, it's all about having transparent standards, transparent structures, so that the abilities that we train in is to perform tasks which are standard tasks, and those are then the tasks that you're actually being rewarded on. Yeah, any questions? So, um, mixing the big strategy, um, the good to great, a bit about change management, and then we come to the focus strategy in DHL Express. This is the translation of the three bottom lines of the DPDHL group, which are employer of choice, provider of choice, and investment of choice. And you can see being employer in choice of choice is driven by respect and results being provider of choice, which means, of course, that we are the customer's first choice, is all about simplifying people's lives. So if you remember the excellence simply delivered, that's translated into there. And investment of choice is, of course, that we'd like our shares to go high, and we'd like the cash flow to come in, and we'd like to be a good investment, which, is the, um, which of course, is the, uh, the aim of loads of successful businesses. Um, so can I translate this into our four focus pillars? which is the fundament, it's been the fundament since 2010. So having a continuous strategy which not changes is a comfort for people and it's also an enabler or a fundament on, upon which you can build massive programs and cultural changes and people engagement. And for us it all starts with motivated people. Um, and the motivated people are the ones who want to perform, they want to be part of our company and they are intrinsically motivated. They love coming to work every day, they love what they do, um, they have fun with it, and they are willing to, to make an extra effort, effort if it is demanded. And it's also people who want to work together. Um, and Ken Allen is very, very fond of music. He has an awful music taste, but he's very fond of music, and there is nothing uh, that can make emotions invigorated as music, so we actually have signature songs for the folks, but I'm not going to sing to you, you'll be grateful. Um, but for motivated people, it, it's Ain't No Mountain High Off. Do you know it? I'm not going to sing. Um, and actually, that is one of the, the signature songs uh, in a lot of our programs. So it has a very particular meaning to all in DHL Express. Um, and then we have a program, which I'm going to talk to you about uh, in a minute, which is called Certified International Specialist. Once you can see it, it's actually on my key hanger. 
we're all international specialists in DHL. Um, and it was important for Ken Allen to define what is a DHL Express employee. What are, what, wh why are we a differentiator? What are our, our, our special and defining characteristics? And that's being international specialists. You remember maybe previously, we're the most international company. We're connecting people, so of course we have to be that. When we have motivated people, they will smile on the phone. They will be engaged in what they sell. They will be enthusiastic about the company. Um, and they will make sure that they deliver the best they can every day, bring themselves the best of themselves to work every day. And that gives great service quality to our customer. We're a service company, so those touch points and the emotional engagement of the employees will shine through in the delivery of services to our customers. And once they experience a great service quality again and again, their experience will be that they will want to work with DHL a lot. So they will become loyal customers. And I already told you about loyal customers, that they spend more, they stay longer, and they make referrals. So if we have loyal customers, then we have a very good, no um, very good fundament for being a profitable network. Um, and when we are a profitable network, we can invest back in our people, we can invest in our uh, network, and we can invest in the world around us. So these fundamental um, pillars of the, our strategy is what's being communicated year after year after year, and we define it into activities that are linked up to these, these strategic pillars. So whenever we talk about um, results, we actually start with our people. I went to a conference in Dubai for the top thousand in DHL Express, um, and our global management board had 15-minute presentations, and they were all about what the people had done for the company. We had a great 2017, um, and a celebration of our people. Um, so it's, it's, it's not just words or models, it's actually uh, done in real life. So the key resources to then making this strategy come through um, are twofold. First of all, we have the big yellow machine. And second of all, we have our people network. The big yellow machine, of course, is vital to us. It's our physical buildings, it's our IT solutions, it's our processes, it's our hubs, it's our production facilities, um, it's our capacity management, it's our deliveries in our customer service, systems, etc. So all of the things that you can, you can say our production apparatus is the big yellow machine. And then on the other side, we have our people network. Um, and that is the mindset, the culture, the corporation, and the identity of being a certified international specialist. This is a jigsaw that people put together when they go on our quality awareness course, which is a one-day course where we link loads of messages together. We train um, all of our people um, in fundamental knowledge, of course, about DHL Express, our products, our services, our pricing, our brand, um, our customers. And in the middle here, it says, well, what, what brings this together is the people. Because you can have a great yellow network, but without the people, it's just not working. So that leads me over to how we actually do develop our assets um, and our big yellow network or big well yellow machine. Um, we've seen increasing volumes. So of course, we've built out the capacity in our hubs. There's been massive investments over the last five years also in Europe in particular. We have a very big hub in Leipzig that's been expanded. Um, we have hub in East Mid Midlands that's being expanded so that we can um, process all of the shipments that the customers are giving to us and make our service delivery times. Um, with the uh, business to consumer volumes that I told you about before, we've also had to make strategic alliances and redefine how we deliver to people because now we're not only delivering to customers who are at their company from nine to five, we're in particular also and increasingly delivering to you guys who sit here from nine to five and who may be home in the morning or in the evening, who may not even want to be at home to get a parcel but want to go into a box in the supermarket where you're picking up your, um, your milk and uh, oatmeal, 
And so we've, we've made strategic alliances with a number of companies so that we can actually have DHL parcels delivered in SWIP boxes around the country or service points or manned service points. Um, and that has not only been necessary to provide a great service to a new segment um, in the market, it's also been necessary for us to control our cost. Because as you may uh, imagine, then when you go um, into a private household during the day and you can't deliver, you have to go there again and again and again. And you have to call um, and you have to, you'll be over processing basically to get, to get the parcel delivered. Um, due to digitalization, of course, we are updating our systems, um, both the scanners on road, the systems that we have in our various functions, and everybody does that. It's simply a demand. Um, and there are also higher and higher demands on compliance. The latest one that we are working with is uh, data regulation compliance, which you may have heard of. Um, there are now very, very strict regulations from um, end of May this year on how we can deal with customer data and employee data. So there are loads of compliance issues that we constantly need to be um, on top of. But is that particular for DHL Express? That's particular for any kind of machine. TNT has their orange machine. UPS has their brown machine. So the machinery and the updates and, and the changes and implementations we have are not, are not they are necessary and they, are, they have to be project managed. It's big projects, but they are not that complex. They're easy to identify, they're easy to execute, fairly easy to execute, and they are necessary and driven by external factors. Um, or by the way we develop our business and the service delivery that we can foresee that you guys either here or in your companies will have. Instead, um, when, we when we develop our people network, it becomes more complex because people are different and as I told you before, changing behaviors is a big ask. So there are loads of stuff that needs to be in place and it has been developed, we've developed loads of activities and we have loads of activities around our culture. So these are some of the, um, the examples or very specific examples about how we create the influences that I told you about before to not only to have changed the culture in DHL Express to be the one that we needed to perform, um, but also to maintain and reinforce every day the culture that we have, because it's a living thing. It has to be reenacted every day. The ones of you who've had um, system theory knows that the system is constantly evolving, constantly being reproduced, and that means that it takes a lot of effort um, to uphold the, uh, the culture that we have already now. So of course, a lot of storytelling goes, goes into it. And then we have um, our program, various kind of programs, um, and we have a lot of events to create these vicarious experiences for people. Um, it also goes down into the individual leader-employee interaction uh, on a daily basis. And then, of course, it's also about how we create role models, who we promote in our internal media, who we reward and why we reward them, that we do it on basis of the, of the values that we have and the behaviors that they show and that it's a consistent flow of reinforcing um, and telling our people about the behaviors that we expect them to have. So structurally, that in the motivation part goes into formal awards, formal recognition, um, and our performance management, what we incentivize people on, so that, um, so that it becomes very transparent when you're a star within Express, and also when you're not. And then, of course, we have campaigns, um, which are run both from global and also nationally, about fit to work, fit to live. Five minutes, good, thank you. Um, so those are some of the activities that we have. Um, on the ability side, we recruit people who fit into our culture first, because we feel that we can train them to do anything that they will need to do. Of course, we'd like to have some basic um, abilities, particularly on our specialist roles, but it's very important for us that we get the right minds and the right culture on our new people. And then we train them, um, we have massive curriculums, um, and of course we also have the expectations of our core competency, competencies, which people are evaluated on. So it's very transparent what we expect from people. I've um, 
brought some pictures. It's very difficult to communicate a culture um, in words and just standing here. So I've, I've brought up a few pictures. Um, the framework here is our certified international specialist program. It's a massive program where people have induction programs, they are onboarded in a process, um, and at this moment in time we have 10 classroom days for any new employees, also on our what we call cross-functional courses, and then on top we have functional courses for each of our departments. Um, I just he recently heard that the ones who are running this try to get um, it certified in Guinness Book of Records as the world's largest culture and employee engagement program. And Guinness said, no, we can't because it's not replicable. It's simply too big. It's a massive program. And it's all about reinforcing culture and providing people skills. We have um, the four guys here, our role models that we use uh, and our personas that we use in campaigns, etc. And the four attributes, speed, can do, right, first time, and passion, are put into, for instance, our rewards programs so that people actually nominate employees or managers on account of how they lift these every day. We have them on our cups. It's very transparent. Um, and of course, there are other parts. The one down here is the value card. I carry it with me every day. Everybody has one. So it becomes a thing in day life. If you're an international specialist, I've got my pin from my induction. I have my I Love IT from one of our campaigns um, where we uh, appreciate the support that we get. I'm going to skip this one and go into right leaders. Um, you may recognize Ken Allen. This is from our football cup. Very low hierarchy. You may also recognize Frank um, standing there. He stands with Cliff. Cliff is a supervisor out in our Copenhagen um, airport. So they said hi, talked about handball at an international event they had. And I think characterizes very well the low hierarchy. I went into a, um, a headquarters of a very big, well-esteemed Danish company um, a few weeks back and talked about how they felt um, about being a great place to work. And I was told that their managers didn't like going to the Christmas lunch because they made employees, and employees wanted to talk about their work. And they, they didn't think that was a lot of fun. Um, but we do. I mean, we're on the floor in front of people every day, and that's what we have to be as leaders and managers, and we have to appreciate them. So we, when we have great results, we put out thank you cards, we give giveaways, we make recognitions, both structural or sort of in campaigns, but also on an individual level every day. Motivated people, um, you've got the slides. We do lots of crazy stuff. We uh, dress up for carnival and have a laugh about that. Um, when we won Country of the Year 2017, which was announced here in January, um, we impromptu took some confetti tubes and ran around the head office and waved a flag and got people to make a snake into our customer service. And there was confetti everywhere. And we sent confetti bombs out into our sites. So the confetti here is from, um, from the Copenhagen hub. We also have sites elsewhere where they did their own celebration. Um, and that's a kind of everyday activity, which is easy to do, but I mean, and some people would think it would be embarrassing, but we just think it's fun. Because that's, you know, we just have, we want to have fun. We work hard, but we also want to have fun. Um, and the other part is I asked people to our Great Place to Work culture profile if they would just on Facebook give me three words that they felt characterized DHL. And that was the question. Could you please give me three words that you feel characterizes DHL for you? And they came up with all of these words. And I thought it was quite moving. Um, and I think the, the best proof of being a great place to work and having that culture and being successful in the endeavors is that we came second in Great Place to Work last year. We're aiming for a first place because we think we're worth it. We think we can do that. And we think we have the kind of, of organization that can manage that. And that's all about having employees who come to work every day thinking, why would I work anywhere else? Because this is a good life. Not just a good work life, but a good life. And customers can feel it. And we're being profitable. We're making the results because we have that kind of mindset. And that also means, this is just from um, the last week, people going on holiday, putting this up on social walls. You know, wherever we go, whenever we spot DHL, we need to communicate it because we're proud and we love it. 
and this is Ken Allen's wall. All of the things that I've told you into one, with slogans and value messages, and people are coming into his office getting pictures taken in front of that. He puts it up at every given chance. We sing and dance, and we make great results. So that's it, implementing a business model. Thanks a lot. Questions, comments? Yeah, we have one again. So um, you talk about this uh, low uh, hierarchy, mm -hmm. but uh, just from what we have just been taught, it seems like a, 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 a hierarchical, it's difficult to say, uh, decision-making um, structure, but it's, I guess, you conceal it in a, a, you, I mean, the, the managers in detail, they are relatable and that's why it becomes less hierarchical, but I guess your decision-making structure is hierarchical. Well, there's a difference between having a hierarchical management style and having a hierarchy in an organization, because, of course, in relation to escalations, decisions, etc., you need to have a hierarchy, you need to have know who's got mandates. Um, and they're not really questioned because with a role comes a responsibility, comes a mandate, also a decision mandate. So for me, there is not an opposition between having a hierarchy, even though it's low, because everybody can go into the MD's office and talk about a decision, uh, which is something that drives um, foreign managers crazy, you know, that Danes will always discuss any kind of decision. It's a, it's a matter for debate, it's not just something where you jump. Um, so, and that's low hierarchy. It's being able, as you say, to relate to managers that they are people, and they are people managers. They are not taskmasters. Um, so, of course, there's a hierarchy, and of course, there are structures. And I would say one of the reasons why our CIS program has been so successful, because we also train managers, is because it's a top-down approach. So, when I have new managers coming on board, I, the MD, and another senior management team member will be facilitating a three-day introduction course on how we want them to be leaders. And that has a great effect because it's role modeling. And in, in hierarchies, having role models is a very good way of leading, but also setting expectations. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? I was just wondering, it seems that some of this about decision, it's a huge standardization process, both a cultural and a decision-making standardization process. Co come again. You're, you're, you're creating a system that's based on, on operating standard operating procedures and a lot of it. That's right. We have a lot of standards. Um, so if, if I'm looking at, <laughs> at your, the, the change you made from the big strategical change uh, where you were losing money, before the strategic change, you had a, a value proposition that were based on, uh, you could almost argue, differentiation. If there's a problem in the market, we'll pick up the bag, we'll sit mm -hmm. up shop, and we're going to lose a lot of money, but we're going to deliver the target. And, and the change you made, because you were losing money, which was the key problem, is, is you change into a, a, a cost strategy, a serious cost strategy. Yeah, there was a very serious cost consideration there. Um, and one of the things that I didn't mention is that we were accommodating both international parcels and domestic. And sending stuff within a country is very expensive and it's a high competitive market. Um, so one of, the, one of the things in focus, in the focus strategy and also in our core competencies was going back to being international as a key strategic factor. That it's, it was business to business, international shipments, and we actually pulled out of a very expensive domestic market in the US, which was a cost cutting strategy. Yeah, so you're absolutely correct. But the, in the same way, the, the, uh, the lean, the Six Sigma, all these things, these are efficiency strategies, driving costs down, making sure that all processes are just running really, yeah. really smooth. And they're also engagement strategies. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing which is fun about process improvements, particularly when you do it with Lean and Six Sigma, you involve people because you feel you, you thoroughly believe that they have the mandate, they know what they're doing on the flo shop floor. They will n um, see the hindrances that there is to deliver a great service quality every day. They will see the waste in the processes. 
So involving people, and we actually put together, in some of the process um, improvement workshops we have, we put together 14 people to map processes, but they felt involved, which meant also that when they had to go back and implement in order to be efficient, because I, I, I just heard the last part you said, asked us about, so we make structures, but we may not always follow them. Um, so if you want improvements to be efficient, involving people in making the changes so that they've had a mandate and decided what to do with the business is a very good engaging and change enabling factor. I was wondering, is there a tension between this keeping uh, brand loyalty, I mean maintaining your customers, be because uh, your main strategy has so far been to focus on business to business, meaning that the, the amount of training or, or the, the variation between customers are quite low, so it's easy to train your employees to tackle that customer segment. Is there a tension in the new customer segment between these two? I think the, the only difference is that um, business, business customer knows that if you go into Canada, Canada, Canadian goose.dk mm. and buy um, a jacket for 100 euros and the translation is poor, then it's probably not a Danish website. But when business to consumer customer, when private customers do that, they expect not to pay VAT and duties and all of that. So the level of knowledge is different. Mm. And we, we particularly see it within the customs area. So it, if any of you buy on the internet, which you probably do, then be aware that if you have to import into the European Union, then there are duty VAT on it, because we're getting loads of calls on that. Um, but besides that, the, um, the rest of it is actually pretty much the same. The private customers all also expect to have timely delivery. They also expect to have a friendly courier. They also expect to have a knowledgeable, polite and helpful um, customer service agent. So in that respect, it's not really that massive a change. We haven't had to do any B2C training courses because the training that we're giving, the skill set that we're giving on soft skills, for instance, goes as well with business customers as private customers. But you're also working through partners. So a lot that's of true. the customer co touch point is moved into partners. Yeah. How do you control that in? Because well, that, we that's outside your value chain, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, it's actually, um, it's, it's crossing, um, it's doing something that you would normally not do which is outsourcing a value-added part because the delivery is a value-add. Um, and we've been working with external couriers. So actually our couriers are to a large extent employed by service partners. What we do is we train them as we would our own employees. So we're giving them, we are inviting them to our um, social events. When we have giveaways, they get giveaways. So we tie them into our culture in order for them to provide the same experience. We're getting great feedback. And now we've actually started insourcing some of our couriers, um, primarily because we want them to stay longer. We want to have that even further connection with them. But training-wise, it's simply by providing the frontier the same kind of training that we would if they were employed by us. Thank you. Any, we're running out of time here, so any questions, things, worries? Anything? No? Okay. No? Well, then I guess I'm going to thank you for listening and being passionate about DHL Express. Uh, and I hope that you will have great success in your studies going forward. Thank you so much. So we're going to be back and start again 10 minutes past. So see you soon. <laughs>